Hey everyone, my name is Fraser Cain. I am the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, June seventh, two thousand and thirteen. Joining me this week is a core crack team of super duper space journalists. We've got David Dickinson from Florida. Hey, David. Hey. And we've got Jason hey. Major from also the East Coast. Up in Rhode Island. You're on Rhode Island, That's yeah. Basically, northern Florida. <clears throat> How many how many uh, icebergs big is Rhode Island? Um, how many how many the, asteroids the large? Out there, yeah, <laughs> some of the icebergs out there. We might we might be half of an iceberg. Yeah, I, I we, measure I measure all my uh, all my asteroids in in Rhode Islands. How many Death Stars is that? <laughs> how many Death Stars is that? Um, so today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Antarctica under the ice, uh, a truck sized asteroid uh, that's going to slip past the Earth. Uh, the June Ariatids, which is another meteor shower. Uh, the ATV, which is currently uh, tracking the space station. Uh, test of the Falcon 9R. An awesome amateur photo of the Ring Nebula. Can you see the Great Wall of China from space? And electrified exoplanets. So we've got a bunch of stories this week. And we're going to be doing like triple duty, each of us. So uh, that's cool. So this is cool. I, who, I, I kind of like the idea of like a smaller group. We'll, we'll keep it, uh, you know... We'll keep it uh, cozy. Um, yeah. Um, right. So uh, before we get rolling, a few things you can do. So if you want to communicate with us, you can do this, although the uh, technology is a little weird today. But yeah, so if you're watching this over on Google+, Plus, you can. Uh, if you're watching this just in my stream, you can make a comment there, and I'll catch it. If you're watching this on the event page, you can make a comment there, and we should be able to notice it there. Uh, if you're watching this just embedded somewhere, then just use Twitter. You can use the hashtag Space Hangout. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can uh, you can just make a comment there. And I will warn you, uh, the other sources are getting a little hard to find, so the safest place is over on YouTube. Now, normally, <clears throat> this is popping up on Nicole's YouTube, but Nicole is on the road today, so this is going to be on my YouTube. But whatever you do, wherever you're watching this, just click watch on YouTube and then you'll be able to, to comment there and, uh, and join the conversation. I would also like to send a sort of uh, special uh, recovery message to Amy Sure Title, who normally joins us and is kind of in the hospital right now. So if you look at her Facebook over on Google yeah, Plus, yeah, she, uh, she has some sort of chronic intestinal thing that has been sort of dogging her and uh, and if she doesn't, and she was on a road trip to move from uh, Arizona to the East Coast, I guess joining you guys over on the East Coast, and uh, got kind of sick halfway there and <laughs> ended up in Tennessee in a hospital. So, wow. Yeah, and so if you see the picture of her, it's she's got a tube up her nose, and yeah, she doesn't look very happy. So, I <clears throat> we tried to get her in with you know with the with the tube up her nose and the cover you know just <laughs> I don't know the the logistics of it anyway so so a speedy recovery to Amy we're really you know we hope you kind of get through this and uh, and you're able to join us again uh, within a couple of weeks so all right and Nicole is uh, now now we're sort of down to a small group because of the American Astronomical Society meeting so a ton of space news was coming pouring out of the uh, of the meeting. But uh, and that also sort of has kept a lot of people busy and even traveling. And I know Nicole is flying back from the the AAAS, so um, which is always a party. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go, Jason. Let's talk about this uh, this really cool simulation of what Antarctica would look like without the ice. You talk. I'll find you a picture. All right. Um, well, over the past mm, over the past several years, uh, the uh, Missions have been flying uh, around Antarctica from, from NASA's um, ICESat uh, satellite mission, uh, Operation Ice Bridge, um, has been doing multiple passes. That's a six-year program. They kind of bounce back and forth between the South Pole and the North Pole. And um, they've been just gathering up tremendous amounts of data uh, regarding what's going on with the ice uh, at both poles. The British Antarctica Survey has taken all of these data points um, and put it together, this, this super high-res map of the bedrock that's underneath Antarctica's ice. Now, you know, Antarctica's a big continent. It's, it's half, again, the size of the contiguous United States. Uh, and that's a lot of ice, you know, that, that's, that's covering it um, up to, you know, two, uh, two, three miles thick in some places. 
So to know what's happening with the ice is really tricky because you know you 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 can't see what it's sitting on uh, very well unless you get these these uh, high definition uh, data sets. So the image that Fraser just put up is this new high definition millions of data points map of the terrain underneath Antarctica's ice. Um, now there's been some some vertical exaggeration there. I believe it's about a uh, magnitude of about 17, uh, just to you know from this from this perspective be able to see what's happening with the mountains and the valleys and you know, all of that good stuff. But um, you know as you can see the the amount of detail is just incredible. Being able to see what what's happening beneath the beneath these miles these miles of ice you know coming from from the shore to the interior. Um, I mean, this is literally unprecedented. Yeah. So this is a uh, this is a map that will be used for you know for decades um, by by climate scientists um, and researchers to figure out you know what's going to happen with Antarctica's ice, especially as the uh, climate continuously warms. Um, where is it going to move? Because you know, sitting on top of uh, this terrain, the ice. Moves. I mean, basically, it, it, it you know it heads it heads downslope. Um, so now that we know what where downslope is, you know we have an idea of what's happening under there. And and unlike the Arctic, unlike the Arctic, which is you know a frozen ocean, um, in Antarctica you, we have an ice cap on top of land. So uh, you know it's not just it's not just ocean underneath there. The the whole shape of the continent looks radically different than what you see with the ice too. It's interesting to see the, the outline. And I think, yeah. you know, we know that the, you know, all this ice is pushing down, is really driving down the the continents. It's And so I would be really interested to see what, as another simulation of if that ice is gone, what would that do, you know, how would the 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 land recover, how would it sort of pop back up how without all that, that weight on top of it. Yeah, so, <laughs> but true. I mean, you know, spoiler alert, right? The, welcome to your future, right? Both yeah, your past yeah. and your future. I mean, you know, you can't see that image and not think, God, what if all that ice melts away, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, Antarctica has in its ice cap uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 90% of the world's fresh water. Um, locked up there, so you know that's that's pretty incredible. Yeah, Between, there'd be a whole you know, lot of there'd be a whole lot of new meteorites uncovered when that starts melting. Yeah, <laughs> right. So we'll be under two hundred feet of water, but we will have some new meteorites, and that's I think what's really important. Some that's good. That's good. Out. You're always really thinking on the positive, David. I like that. <laughs> what, um, what can we find under there? Can we of find course, under you know, there? Of course, Antarctica was in a different position uh, millions, hundreds of millions of years yeah, ago. So yeah. you go under there, you know, you'd also find fossils and all sorts, all sorts of other good stuff from when yeah. it was much more of a tropical place. I'm going to go start my car up right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about this newly found truck-sized asteroid that's going to be passing the Earth on the on the eighth. Yeah, there's uh, asteroid 2013 LR6. I'm not sure who discovered it. It probably was one of either the Catalina Sky Survey, uh, looking at the current position of it. That's what I would guess. I, I just heard about this asteroid a few hours ago, actually. It's 5 to 16 meters in size and is passing on June 8th at 4.43 UT, which would be just 43 minutes past midnight Eastern time here. It's passing 69,000. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually an Apollo asteroid. It goes out through the uh, asteroid belt and makes its journey in here near perihelion, very near Earth. It's going to pass 69,000 miles. Um, it's about a quarter of the Earth or a third the Earth-Moon distance. Uh, yeah, it's passing about point, yeah, right about a third, 0.29 lunar distances, about three times the geosync distance of the geosynchronous satellites. So that's, that's pretty close. Anytime it pa an asteroid passes nearer than the moon, it usually grabs my attention. Uh, there, we've always got asteroids that are passing further than that away, but it's, it's once or twice a month or so we get something within the lunar distance. And then the first, Usually one of the first two or three things I'm thinking is, is it coming anywhere near the moon, which this one isn't? And the second thing I'm thinking with that kind of small size we were talking about before the show, is there a possibility it might be any kind of space junk? 
what I do is I look at a lot of the earlier passes. I run some simulations and look at a lot of the earlier passes, like 1994, there was a pass, 1967, there was a pass. Then I try to match it up roughly with any launches that might have went into solar orbit around that time, either unmanned probes. I kind of, I kind of, my heart kind of skipped a beat at first when I saw 1967, because there was a lot of Apollo activity around that time. But I matched it up, and it doesn't look like it's any old Apollo boosters out there. But it has happened before. We have found near-Earth asteroids that had very suspicious orbits, and they've done a little bit of checking, and they found out they were actually old Apollo boosters or things from the Venera program that launched to Venus. Anything out there, uh, the Apollo 10 uh, lunar module is still out there, Snoopy. Uh, that never landed on the moon. That was the dress rehearsal for Apollo 11. They jettisoned it in solar orbit. It's still out there. It could come back around, and, and we may see it again someday. That's really neat. So this is sort of about the same size as the Chelyabinsk, Chelyabinsk um, yeah. Yeah, asteroid. And so, you know, yeah. <laughs> we this saw what is... happened when those things do hit the Earth. And, and this one's this one's no threat. I think it's cool. We're starting to see them before they come near the Earth. The one thing yeah. with the Chelyabinsk meteor, uh, it, one of the reasons we didn't see that prior is it was coming from a solar direction. It was coming from the sun. It was literally coming at the Earth out of the sun. And you can see that on those dashboard cams when you look at the sun direction versus where the asteroid is coming in. Oh, but they actually neat. did. Yeah. They actually did check and and trace back the orbit from this one, and that's one of the reasons. Uh, and there was a little bit of flurry activity before that to see if any of the the sky surveys or anybody had photographed it prior to, like, the night before. And yeah. it turns out one of the reasons it came from our solar blind spots, one of the reasons we didn't see it prior to impact. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, this, you know, this kind of thing happens all the time. I mean, as you said, you know, we, we get close passes, large passes. You know, what we don't want are close, large passes. <laughs> Right, but yeah. uh, but you know Definitely. various objects, and it's I mean it's, the Catalina Sky Survey is is just you know is tracking down these objects one after the other and trying to really understand what kind of a risk we face in the future. So and I think I think it's good we're seeing them before they come by rather than after they hit. This yeah, was we literally discovered just a couple days ago, correct? I think this one was discovered in the last twenty four hours. Yeah. It just came up this morning. It started trickling through uh, various Twitter feeds and stuff. I think it was discovered last night, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and you're going to be able to with, watch the flyby uh, live on the Internet. With the designation LR6-2013, I'm pretty sure that that sounds, because that, the letter designations go are periodic, I'm pretty sure that sounds pretty recent. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, I don't know, I, I'm kind of, on the one hand, I get quite excited, and it always keeps reminding you that we need to have these surveys to the next level. I mean, this is sort of what yeah. this ARCID telescope is. One of the goals down the road It's these these new space telescopes are going to be out that. there. Yeah, yeah, and actually starting to uh, track these these dangerous objects. You know, you know, to mine them. I mean, this you know, it might be made of solid you know platinum. You don't know. And so we want to start identifying them and tracking them and figuring out their locations. And also, if any are going to be in some kind of dangerous risk orbit to us, then Hopefully we can, we have, can figure out a way to, they, to prevent it. Have they broke a million dollars on Kickstarter? Oh, I'm sure they, they were, have. They were, they they were, were really close. 000. They were like 800000 a couple of days ago. I need to throw some shekels at them. There. I, I did. It's actually cool. I haven't, yeah. I've got it on my to-do. I haven't done it yet, but yeah. I need to. I, uh, I, put in, I went for the, the space selfie, so I put in 25. Yeah, just, uh, just so I can have the Twitter icon with the picture of me in space. Yeah, you know, totally. everybody will be changing their icon <laughs> once they get their photo. Uh, they're at, right now, they're at 801,000, so, you know, yeah. I know this completely compromises my journalistic integrity, but go out and donate. No, Let's get cool the space telescope in space. Yeah. It's one of this the cooler is, Kickstarters I've seen. Absolutely, I'm super excited. Yeah, this is this is I think going to open up a whole new oh, sort of set of missions. And and real quick, this asteroid, I did the I checked on the visual circumstances on it. It's not going to be great for a backyard object. It's going to be about 13th magnitude, and it's headed down toward the southern constellations of Centaurus and Vela. So it's not yeah. going to be uh, unless you've got a really big uh, rig and observatory. It's not going to be anything. I don't know if SLU is going to track it. They might, but it's not going to be a great backyard object. Uh, well, let's, give, let's talk about the, the Ariatids meteor shower, which is coming up. 
Yeah, the, the gamma irritids are one of the lesser known. It, it would be a really good meteor shower if it wasn't a daytime shower. This shower, the radiant, where you're talking about where the meteors are coming at you from in the sky, is actually very ill placed at this time of year. It's coming from the constellation Aries, which is also the sun is positioned very nearby the, the constellation at the same time. So we're getting the radiant almost, again, we're talking about getting asteroids from the sunward direction. These meteors are coming at us from the sunward direction. But I did notice on space weather, uh, you can track these via radio. They're getting the pings from them on uh, radio. And I've actually done before, if you have an old school car FM radio, you can hear if you tune off to a, a non-used uh, non station, you can occasionally hear, kind of like if you've ever listened to a lightning storm during, uh, with an FM radio tuned to static and you can hear the bursts of static, you can actually hear, observe a meteor shower on the FM band if it's intense enough where you can actually hear these pops and pings and those are actually meteors. Uh, so they're, they're tracking it on Space Weather, too. There's a link where you can actually track these. You might see a few strays in the morning. There may be the geometry may be just right if you get a really bright fireball, but it's not a meteor shower you generally observe. Yeah, now we've got an article on Universe Today on this, and Bob King, who's the guy who, who wrote that one, you know, it's he was mentioning it's a pretty powerful... Um, yeah. It's a it's a fairly powerful shower. Like you're going to see 50 to 80 per hour, but the problem, as you said, is that the where they're originating is so low in the sky that the the, uh, the irritids would be as well known as the parasites, which is the next big one in August. They would be as infamous as the parasites or the leonids if they yeah. happen at, if they happen about six months later or earlier when that shower radiant was placed right uh, for evening viewing and after morning viewing, you would more people would know about the daytime irritants. Yeah. And so and so that's the sort of that's the take that Bob took on this article is like it's you know, let's see a daytime meteor shower. You know, this yeah. is you know and that, you know, there's gonna be a lot of them. You're probably only gonna see the fireballs, but you know, if you're gonna see a meteor in the daytime because the meteor was so bright, that's actually pretty special. So yeah, we don't have a really good meteor the next uh, crowd pleaser meteor showers and parasites in August. Yeah. There's a few more minor ones. But the parasites are kind of the, the old faithful of meteor showers. Totally. They come around every year. And they're just, you know, for us in the northern hemisphere, they're just set in the middle of summer where you can go out and lie outside and not freeze to death and the kids stop complaining and everyone's got their hot chocolate and we just enjoy the meteor shower. It's, that's that's probably some of my earliest observing memories growing yeah, up. Yeah, me too. Watching yeah, the parasites, totally. So, yeah. yeah, but I mean the Leonids, I mean I think the mo you know, the Leonids were the most powerful, most amazing I, one. Did you see the one? It was like back in like I, 2000, I think, 2001. I saw, I saw the Leonids from Kuwait in 1998, and it's probably, I would put up there as one of the two or three most awesome things I'd ever seen in person. Yeah, yeah, same same as me. Like, And I was in the middle of Vancouver when it was happening, and I found just a part, a place near my house that was in shadow, and then I could just watch these, these meteors, and they were just coming super fast, really bright meteors. We, we estimated a zenithal hourly rate toward morning of about about maybe 900 to 1,000. Oh. They were coming, which is literally, you think there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. So they're coming every couple seconds. When you're seeing a zenithal rate of 1,000 per hour, that's literally one every two or three seconds. And you get some of those stories, right, of these classic meteor sh yes. storms, the yeah. ones where there are tens of thousands of meteors per hour. Yes. Can you just the imagine... Last the last time the Leonids produced, the Leonids can do that every 33 years. And in 1966, they they put on uh, an amazing show for people that have lived that long that remember it. From 66, they literally were doing. They said up toward 10 to 20 thousand per hour, which you're seeing. They said that you could actually sense the motion of the Earth. You think of the old Star Trek where they're going at warp drive and the stars are coming by. They said the meteors had that appearance. Kind of, you could actually sense. The, the actual orbital motion of the Earth in real time. You could see it, which is, it's got to be pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's move on. So, uh, uh, Jason, you had a story about electrified exoplanets. Yes, this is very cool. Um, this was also something that came out of uh, the AAS meeting. Um, and that was on, I think this was presented on Tuesday. Um, so, some of the interesting planets that the, uh, that the Kepler mission has found are these oddballs called hot Jupiters. Now, here in our solar system, uh, the gas giants in Jupiter, I mean, they're, uh, they're out beyond the rocky inner planets. Um, but, and that's where they may form, 
But in other exosystems, uh, these these Jupiter-sized planets, these big gas giants, um, have actually either formed or migrated. Now, that, I'm not quite sure which yet, but um, they've, they've come in close to their home star. And, I mean, you know, instead of being 500, um, instead of being 500 million miles away, like they are here, uh, they're actually closer in towards a star than Mercury is in our solar system. So that gets them really, really hot, obviously. Um, and it puffs them up. You know, it makes these, like, these, like, popcorn exoplanets uh, where they, they, get, they get super hot, up, you know, thousands of degrees, and uh, they get inflated. But one of the things that they've witnessed in some of these hot Jupiters is they're, they're more inflated, they're puffier than they should be um, considering how close they are to their stars and what the, uh, what the heat outpouring of the stars is. And what they found is more magnetic, magnetically active, uh, more magnetically active su uh, stars have puffier hot Jupiters. So, in order to you know, to kind of model why that is, why why are these why why do more active stars have have um, puffier hot Jupiters? Um, and I, I jotted his name down here. Uh, it was it was. Dr. Derek Buzasi from the Florida Gulf Coast University. Now he's done some modeling on on what may be happening in these magnetically active uh, exosystems, and he's figured out that it may actually be uh, heating via electrical current. So these hot Jupiters are behaving, and, and he uses the term "flying toasters." They're they're mm -hmm. picking up uh, electrical currents that are coming into their poles from their host star and that electrical current is, is closing inside the atmosphere of the hot Jupiter, uh, basically depositing heat the same way coils do uh, inside a, a toaster. So what's happening is, is you know, the, uh, there's, there's huge amounts of, um, and, I, and I'm not an electrical engineer so I don't know how to, how to say this so I just check my notes here, it's billions of amps at voltages of millions of volts, so that's that's a significant current, um, and it's just depositing heat in the upper 10 percent of the atmosphere of these hot Jupiters. So, in addition to the heat that they already are generating in the interior, in addition to being that close to their own star, they're also getting a boost uh, in heat um, from this electrical current that's running through their atmosphere. So that's that's really interesting, and of course, um, you know studies of exoplanets and what's happening in their atmospheres is a continuously ongoing science. So, you know, as we know what mechanics are happening here, we can uh, uh, further model what type of weather and, and what type of environment we can find in these, in these really exotic exoplanets. And from what I understand, and this is, I think this was also announced during this, this week, is that there seems to be some kind of mechanism that's keeping the planets in a stable orbit as opposed to having them just spiral inwards to their death that that there is some kind of balance between <clears throat> the forces from the planet and its interaction with the star that's mm -hmm. stopping the, the planet from just getting gobbled up yeah they're not just they're not just like a all defense mechanism to their to the star yeah. and, you know, getting and getting destroyed now what the mechanism is there I haven't followed that up I followed up on that so I'm not quite sure uh, what the research is on that in fact I don't know. yeah I think that was a separate release and I don't think any of the people who are in here actually worked on that story but I but I saw it just tangent you know I was work you know I think it was on uh, I was looking through the AAAS press releases and that was sort of that was a separate story about their their defense mechanism well that so, seems to make sense though because yeah. you know if you think about it if 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 the typical behavior of these you know, hot Jupiters was to end up inside their star. Well, then, you know, statistically, we probably see a lot less of them than we do, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, if if that's where they were going to end up, then you know, what's the odds that at any given moment, right now, um, or you know, over the past three years that Kepler's been looking out there, we would see as many hot Jupiters as we do if they're you know probably you, going to end up in their star. You just have um, to happen to catch them at that phase of their life. Yeah, I mean, it, I I don't know if I don't know if it's statistically improbable that that would that would be the fact, or you know, or or it's more like that that they're going to stop at a certain point and and manage to stay in in a stable orbit, um, thus getting heated and you know all that other good stuff. 
I've seen some articles. I've seen some articles recently speaking of exoplanets that the Alpha Centauri exoplanet. They're kind of casting some doubt on that now. They're not even. Uh, yeah, Alpha Centauri BB. They're not even quite sure if that's. You know, is it actually even there? Yeah. And of course, you know, it's a shame now that they've already gone and uh, they've already gone and, and, and <laughs> you know given a name to it. Yeah. All right. So that's that's an, that's an interesting question. Is is that is our closest exoplanet? Even, even, even yeah. Uh, okay, so let's let's move on here. So there's a cool, uh, a really amazing picture. Actually, you know, let's start with the ATV. So the, there was the launch of the uh, Albert Einstein. Yes, ATV four. Albert Einstein launched out of French Guiana just a couple days ago, headed to the ISS docking on June fifteenth. So it's it's got a while before it docks. And a lot of people have been able to see it. Remember last week we were talking about how we're getting this geometry of passes where the ISS is visible throughout the length of its orbit. So that means anything placed up there chasing the ISS is in a similar geometry where people are seeing it worldwide, especially Europe in, in northern latitudes along like uh, southern Canada, northern U.S. There's been a lot of sightings of it. I haven't seen it yet. I saw the ISS this morning, but I have not seen the ATV-4. Uh, and also the... Arion Stage 2 booster is chasing it as well because uh, there's been sightings over in Europe and UK. And I've seen a few images already that people have taken images of both the booster and the ATV-4. Uh, it was 20 minutes behind it. The geometry has been changing. Heavens Above is already tracking it, so that'd probably be the best place to look for passes. Heavens Above has it right up there on their front page. Uh, I'm, I'm tracking it through Space Track and Orbitron, but that, that's a little more technical to use. Orbitron? Uh, Orbitron is actually a freeware program that, it, what's cool about it is you can download it and run it on your desktop in the field. You don't need the internet connection. So if you want to track satellites out at a star party or something like that, you can have Orbitron. And it's got the cool NASA graphic where it shows the orbit and the position. The only thing about Orbitron is you have to, uh, you have to you know how to manually load TLEs, which are two-line elements, basically the orbital elements for the satellite. So it's it's for more for hobbyists and, and people that are a little more technical into like actually can can there's some things about TLEs even I don't know so well that's that's awesome I'm glad you dive that deep into this information uh, okay so I want to share a couple of images Fraser, here. Uh, well one one thing that was cool and we have it up um, we have it up on on Universe today I think from uh, from yesterday is that the German Space Agency had a um, they have a, a, a special camera set up on the um, on the ATV four and well, I heard that's going that. to be taking uh, stereo pictures from the entire mission um, yeah. it, so that they can they can kind of like watch this all in three D uh, wow. and it, and it was filming from launch and it's it, to separation to orbital insertion and it's actually going to continue uh, uh, taking footage through docking, and I believe even um, uh, re-entry. That's neat. So, so they do like a yeah, big time lapse Sterex. of the whole thing, yeah. That's the Sterex mission, uh, or the Sterex uh, experiment. And uh, so there's there's four cameras uh, aboard the uh, Albert Einstein. Um, so it, it, there was some really, really great footage, so go check that one on Universe today. I believe this was one of the heaviest, if not the heaviest, ATV launch and Arion launch payload they had ever launched. Maybe one of the heaviest ones they'd launched to the ISS. Yeah, it was, it was it uh, was 20,190 kilograms. Yeah, so it was it was a big payload. But it's great to have this cargo ship rolling now. Like, I f it feels like the new infrastructure is starting to come together. You've got the you've got the jewels. You got know, the ATV. You've got the, the European ATVs, you've got the Soyuz for, for launching people, and you've got the, the SpaceX, you know, Falcon yeah. is starting and, to, to deliver stuff to the space and, station as well. Like, and Taris we will be need, headed there. Yeah, we don't need the space shuttle anymore. Yeah, and you know? Taris, uh, Japan's got the HTV. There's multiple ways to get cargo there. There's still only one way to get people there is through the Soyuz, but that might change in a year or two. Now, when, now when's it going to be docking? That is docking June fifteenth, so we still got another week. Yeah, it's, but it's I mean, taking a while. And and so I mean, I mentioned I did a video just a, you know last week about how to see the International Space Station, and I think you know if you haven't already, go to spotthestation.nasa.gov or sign up for Twist T W I S S T, which is on Twitter. 
just follow Twist, and you'll get a notification when the space station is going to be coming overhead. Yeah, they'll, they'll send you a text message. I just yeah. got one this morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I got you know, one too. Um, just this just this morning. You so, know, but but what you want to do then is if it's going to sort of sync up with that June fifteenth, then suddenly there is a real kind of opportunity for you to see the space station and the ATV chasing it, and you know if you're lucky, you'll see them at various positions connected to each other as it as it moves into dock. I mean, no, no one's going to be able to see the whole thing, but because the station is so high up, it's going to be bright for long periods of time. This is a great time. It's going to be, you know, a few lucky people are going to get a chance to see this happen. Every time I write an article about how to see the station, I hear about new apps and platforms that how to track it. So it seems yeah. like there's there there's always, I use, it's, it's weird to me to think, I've been using Heavens Above since 99. I'm like, wow, that it's been that long that that website's been out there, but that's still one of my favorites. Heavens Above is great, super comprehensive, but also kind of complicated for for people to try and sort of build those those notifications. It's nice to just have something say, "Go outside, yeah. look up." Yeah, I yeah. like that. That's that works for me. Uh, Orbitron is Optimus Prime's stepbrother. Says James <laughs> Yeah, um, it's a great platform. Uh, Orbit Orbitron Prime. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so I'm going to show a couple of pictures if I can here. Is this going to work? Yeah. Okay. So the first one, uh, and this was this was posted to Google Plus, and and I just went bonkers when I saw oh, well, it. I haven't seen this yet. So yeah. So so this is an amateur image of the Ring Nebula, aka M57, done by Fred Herman and Terry Hancock, and they did 25 hours of exposure time. Wow. And I think what's really important to see about this is that there is detail in this image of the Ring Nebula that I've never seen even in things like Hubble. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compare and contrast a Hubble image of the Ring Nebula and just show you what I'm talking about here. Um, yeah, You've got a few right. background galaxies in there, one very prominent, about 11 o'clock. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's so let me just change the screen share here. So I'm going to give you the other one. So here's Hubble. I don't know if I, there's any way to do it. So so you see, you know, with Hubble, you can really see that that ring nebula kind of tight in around that. There's, there's like a star in the middle, although apparently that's not the uh, that's not the white dwarf star. But you can see, you know, the colors are great. The, you know, but if you look at that one that was done by by these amateurs, um, there's so much they, more more detail had, around it. He had you right? mentioned it. He he had the central star in there, and you don't usually see that visually. Yeah, and so like, look at this. Uh, you know, I'm gonna see if I can zoom in here. And and I've I've only ever saw that central star visually once. And that yeah. Was a, that was through a 51 inch telescope. So, so that Hubble image is just this part here, that middle part, and then there's all this other parts around it. Just phenomenal. An amazing piece of of amateur astronomy, and it just shows what the capabilities of, of amateur astronomers are these days. Like, I'm just, yeah, that, just amazing. 25 I mean, hours that, of tracking is dedication. I mean, is he yeah, just, just they, they did it with 12-inch uh, uh, RC telescopes. Yeah, well, well, they're not doing it continuous 25 hours, but what no. that is is that's all, because I've had people ask me before, it's like, did they sit there and guide that for 25 hours? It's like, no, that that is 25 hours cumulative. That yeah. That is the, the way people do images now is they've been up 20 seconds at a time, and they build up an image. Yeah, yeah, but I, but it was just like it just shows like the amateurs are now. I mean, the thing is, is like, you know, a lot of the cases, the amateurs will totally admit that everything they're doing has no value for science. <laughs> that you know, that a scientist would be like, I can't work with this, <laughs> right? But the just the, you know the quality of the images and the beauty and the art of it is just phenomenal. except that they're getting people excited about science, and that's valuable for science. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. Uh, and then the other image that I wanted to show, and this was this was great. So this is um, uh, uh, Commander Hadfield, you know, back on Earth was w sent out a tweet, and he was noting that he tried to see the uh, the Great Wall of China from space. Oh, I saw your article about that. Yeah. And 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 failed. So so I'm putting up a picture right now, and the Great Wall of China is in this picture. And can you find it? And I actually have gone and looked at even the higher resolution one, and there's some stuff that kind of looks like a Great Wall of China, but it's actually, uh, you know, not, or it's like a it's like a frozen river channel, and and you can just imagine if you were like passing, you know, I was sort of thinking like maybe I don't know if I can get the part here, 
Like maybe it's, it's, maybe it's up here. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, um, so so this is this myth, right? That you know, can you see the Great Wall of China from space? And in fact, the myth goes so far as to say you can see the Great Wall of China from the moon, and you absolutely can't. You know, the Great Wall of China is the only man-made object visible from the moon. Totally myth. Total myth. In fact, astronauts have tried and tried to see the Great Wall while they're flying in space, and they and they just can't see it. There's been a few photographs with sort of higher resolution photographs, you know, with, with you know longer lenses taken to try and pull up the details. But but yeah, so I thought that was uh, you would see the was, light. You would see the light from our cities on the nighttime side. That's probably what you'd see for a few. Well, that's exactly it. And then someone thought, you know, a great idea would be for like you know for a bunch of people to stand out with like lanterns or something along the Great Wall, <laughs> and then at night they would be able to see it and they would get an, an image of it. I think that would be really right. neat. So. Back in, in kind of the bizarre history files back in the 19th century, there was an idea. I remember with Lowell, and they thought there was Martians and canals and things like that on Mars. There was actually an idea to try to signal the Martians through burning forest fires, like in geometrical patterns and things like that. Well, and there is a, there's actually been a, a proposal that's kind of similar to that, which is um, that aliens could be attempting to communicate their existence to us by orbiting funny-shaped objects around... Uh, their sun. So if yeah. you if you put like a triangle around the sun and it just orbited, anyone with a large enough telescope would see a really strange, you know, uh, transit happening in front of the star and would say, oh, uh, you know, there's, there's a big triangle floating in front of that star. Therefore. Aliens, because you know, you're not going to get a, you're not going to get a triangle naturally. So I think I think there's some some validity to that. You don't need to build a big radio dish. You can just you know orbit a triangle in front of your star, and then that will tell the per, the berserkers where to go and to destroy. There you your go. Planet. All the von Neumann machines. Yeah, are yeah. Bring the von Neumann. You know, <laughs> like a target. Von Neumann probes come <laughs> here and kill us all. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. Okay, so so the last thing I wanted to talk about was the. Uh, the SpaceX Falcon, the 9R test. Yeah, they did. A, they didn't release a lot of information about it, but they did do an engine test about a week or so ago for the for the upgraded Falcon 9R. They haven't launched the heavy yet. They've been doing the launches up to like the. I went to the CRS2 launch for the Dragon capsule. That's all operational, but these are all upgraded engines. That is one of the benefits of you living in Florida, I gotta say. Yeah, we. Yeah, see you know, I just went. You know, I hopped in the car and I went and watched another rocket launch. Oh yeah, it's a uh, the Kennedy Space Center is a day trip from here, so you 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 can go over and watch launches. It's too was bad the shuttle. Was that in Florida, David, or was it in Texas? I think it was in Texas. I'm pretty sure it was. I don't think it was tested here. It was just a test stand test, and they're going to do a longer test later on, uh, later this year too. So. Yeah, it's, uh... And uh, yeah, and so I mean, SpaceX, you know. Elon Musk has said time and time again that the big problem with space exploration is is the fact that you have to throw away your rocket every time that you know that that only like the fuel on a rocket is really only a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of fuel and then there's millions and millions of dollars of hardware and you know and 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 pumps and all of that that just gets discarded every time and if there's some way to move towards this new future where you could you could end up with a rocket that can yeah. take off get to you know some in with stages or what have you the stages could fly back to earth and and land and you know that if you could somehow do that and reuse the whole rocket then then there, sky's the limit they haven't done this yet but you reminded me at the last press conference I did ask him this too is there are plans for the Falcon 9 to make that fully reusable like the SRBs on the shuttle to actually go out and recover the stages and bring them back and reuse them. They haven't done it on, on these launches yet, but yeah. there's there's talk about doing that. To make it yeah, and that's what the nine. So it's the Falcon Nine R, and the R is mean it go, stands for reusable. Yeah, and it's one of the advantage of the Dragon. Talking about the ATV and all the other the progress and all all those reenter and burn up, but the Dragon gets reused. Is the only one of all the different methods to send cargo up to the International Space Station that gets the Dragon is the only one that gets recovered and reused. Yeah. Right now. And so the plan is, you know, down the road, is this thing is going to take off and then return to the landing site. And they just, they yeah. you know, stick the gas tank, you know, stick the nozzle in, pump it back up, and 
have it launch something else. It, if they get this working, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming they've done the math and it is, it is somehow in there that it's possible, that'll change everything. Definitely, definitely. You know, it will it will be a it will be a gigantic leap forward in in space launch technology. A revolution. So. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's 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 kind of interesting. We're in an interesting time right now where everything's kind of transitioning over. So, yeah, Let's see, I, I'm interested to see when they start man rating dragon capsules, and that's still a few years down the road. But that's when yeah. it's going to get interesting. Yeah, no, it is a really complicated challenge. It's, it's a tricky, but it's a tricky thing to do. And you may never be able to get that upper stage, you know, to be reusable. You may you're going to get the lower stage, like like with the. Um, the SRBs on the space shuttle, right? But that well, that big fuel well, tank that went all the way up to space and kudos to Elon Musk because I've I, I watched recently we were talking about the I watched a documentary the Revenge of the Electric Car and they were talking about between SpaceX and Tesla he's nearly put all his PayPal money that he made back into those projects he he literally has put almost every all his cash back into those projects. Yes. Let me see if I can get. Uh, I don't know if I can get the image of it tested. Um, yeah, it's a. I can't even begin to sort of describe, you know, how much respect I have for this guy because he just, yeah, he's he's creating like two of my dreams simultaneously. I want an electric car. He's, I want. I want space rocket launches. He's the closest we have to a real Tony Stark. So. <laughs> well, he was in the movie, right? They had him do a yeah, cameo was, yeah. in the uh, in the Iron Man. Wait till the Tesla flies. <laughs> oh man, a go. flying electric car. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. Cool. Okay, well I think we're sort of running out of time and running out of stories and uh and I know we all got to get back to work. So uh so if we want to let's see if I had any questions here before we did. Um uh, uh Guido Bibra notes uh there was an old DOS program called STS Plus. I don't know if you ever used that. No? No. Nope. No. Nope. Nope, that's okay. a new one to me. Yeah. But I think that's bef you know, it's like Orbitron but but older. Oh, for sat tracking, yeah, it does sound it sounds very old, but yeah, yeah. it's uh, like I said, I I hear I'm sure there's more out there I've never heard of before. So every time I write an article about Spot the ISS, somebody's like, Oh, there's this cool app that does like I've never heard of that. I know the uh, ones I use. Uh Viol Violated Gorilla, which is an awesome screen <laughs> name. Uh about was mentioning about Antarctica reminds uh him of his favorite uh, Lovecraft story or her uh at the Mountains of Madness. I haven't read that one. Lovecraft. I read it a long time ago. Yeah. I reread it now. <clears throat> um and I think that's all I got. So Oh no, there was one more question. Um uh, Andrew Planet suggests that we could focus on spending really small people as astronauts into outer space. You know, I've I've heard of that possibility before. You know, because just to think of the mass in in food that they would consume, we could somehow it's more of a science fiction ideas rather than build big Battlestar Galactica type spaceships. We yeah. just genetically engineer smaller people. Then you're sending the equivalent of Barbie's dream house to Mars. I mean, that would right? Be that's easy. That's a piece of cake. Yeah. Um, do planets? Uh, Andrew Planet also asks, uh, do planets, especially ones with atmospheres, build up static electricity, and if so, does it discharge in any way? I don't know. We don't have any of our PhDs on hand. Um, uh, James Haney notes, <laughs> twist, noting on the uh, Twitter, uh, I thought that was an M. Night Shyamalan uh, site. So, yeah, a twist? everything's a twist. <laughs> everything's a twist. <laughs> Wait, you know, there was a, the, speaking of the, uh, uh, the, the hot Jupiters and their atmospheres and static and all that other stuff, one of the interesting things that I, that I read um, that also came out of AAS, it was talking about how the planet's atmospheres, as they get warmer, well, obviously, as, as you know, the closer they get and all that stuff, they get really, really hot, they don't have the same composition as, say, Jupiter does here, where you have this uh, methane ammonia atmosphere. You can't have that when you, when you, you know, thousands of degrees. Instead, these hot Jupiters may have uh, silica, silicone, silica, silica atmospheres, rock atmospheres, where it's, it's literally like this, this liquid rock clouds uh, and vapor that, that they're wrapped in. Um, so I, had, I, I just wondered, what, how would that affect the conductivity of an atmosphere 
when it's made of something entirely different and, and possibly even more conductive. So mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, not being a scientist, I don't know if that, that, that makes a difference or not, but it might. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, especially exactly. depending on, on how heat gets dispersed throughout a, a planet. So you may end up with this, this, runaway, um, this runaway effect of, of heating. Um, and how, how the heat is sent around and how the whole electrical currents work and all this other stuff. Well, I know the, uh, you know, with some of the hot Jupiters that they found, uh, they've, been, they've been able to sort of look at the temperature of the atmospheres and you get the situation where the back of the planet, even though it's tidally locked and the back of the planet never faces the star, it's as hot as the front side that is facing the star. And so you've got these super winds that are distributing this heat fully around the planet. It would just be, it'd be something to see up close. I, you know, can you imagine seeing a, an actual photograph of one of these, these hot Jupiters? Yeah, well, they're talking, you know, they're talking about possibly you know, a, a double, a double uh, hemisphere, uh, great red spot type storms, except they're like, you know, they take up a full quarter of a, of a, a hemisphere. I mean, just, you know, really, really intense and exotic alien weather patterns. Yeah, that would be amazing. All right, well, let's wrap this up. So, David, where do we find out more about you? I, have, I am Astrogaz with the Z around on Twitter and on my own website, writing for Universe Today, frequently contributing for Universe Today, Listasaur and Canada.com, and I also have some of my sci-fi poetry in Starline Magazine this month. Very cool. How, where do people find Star, was it Starline Magazine? Starline, uh, it's on the Science Fiction Poetry Association of America website, and they have their own bi-monthly magazine they put out. I'm a wannabe science fiction writer, Had so. I known, <laughs> I would have had you queue up a, a little bit of poetry. Is it like Vogon poetry? <laughs> Actually, I, I hope it's a little better than Vogon poetry. So, so I'm, I'm a wannabe science fiction writer. It's a very tough market to break into. But uh, Jason, where do we find out more? I'm over at lightsinthedark.com. Uh, I'm also writing at uh, Universe Today. I contribute to Discovery News Space, and um, and I'm on Twitter at JP Major. Sweet. Uh, yeah, okay, so and obviously I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and if you haven't already, uh, click subscribe. I'm not sure where it is, wherever you're watching on YouTube. Uh, I've been doing a bunch of really cool videos about uh, space and astronomy. that has been really fun. And we also do the virtual star parties on Sunday night, and that's going to be the next show that we're going to be doing. So Sunday night, virtual star party, where we hook up a bunch of telescopes and show you a live view of the night sky. And uh, David is often someone who joins us, depending Hoping on where I can on. be there. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay, cool. Well, thanks, guys. It was great. And, uh, and good luck to everybody else returning from AAS. I hope you all make it back safe. Uh, and uh, and a speedy recovery to Amy Shore title. So, all right, we'll see you all. Uh, we'll see you all next week. <laughs>